Hey all, Scott here from Art of the Genre, and today I'm gonna to take a look at something that I've always seen a problem in um, with science fiction gaming. Um, and just several different layers, and they're all things that I try to address in Zebulon's Guide uh, to Frontier Space Volume 2, which I'm always working on. Um, anyway, this is just gonna be like a DM's primer, a Game Master's primer, to tell you what I see the problems are in making a extended um, campaign that lasts for a long period of time, years, uh, that continually uh, keeps players' interests. Because what I've seen is a lot of science fiction games uh, are one shots or they go a month or two and then they move back to a fantasy game like Dungeons and Dragons, which just continually kind of beats up on science fiction gaming. And that is to say, I'm not making any assessments that nobody, you know, somebody out there hasn't played Traveler since 1979 and is still playing with the same people 40 years later. They might be. That's absolutely true. But that is an outlier because the numbers don't lie. And if you look at the new releases um, in something like, uh, you know, D20 or, or Roll20, where they're showing you percentiles of stuff that's, that's uh, being played, 5e is about 50%, Call of Cthulhu is 10%, and then 7% broken up between Pathfinder, Pathfinder 2, and Starfinder, uh, or Alpizo's products, and everything else is 1% or less, and just all these little things. So if that tells you anything, um, it would be that uh, the, the, the sphere of influence of gaming is dominated by fantasy. And I'll tell you why I think that is, and how you can switch it up when you're dealing with uh, Star Frontiers or science fiction gaming in general. One of the things that somebody commented on one of the, the posts that I had either in Facebook or here um, was that Starfinder is basically Pathfinder in space. And to me, that might be why, Pat, why Starfinder is getting 1.75% of the play or whatever it is. Um, that it's getting more generated to it because it's a science fiction game. But if they've taken Pathfinder and put it in space, then they understand the specifics of what makes that model work. So without anything else, I'm going to get into the primer. I'm just going to go through a couple of things that I see that are problems with uh, science fiction gaming and how you can overcome those. One primarily is going to be the ease of use of dungeon maps. Um, in science fiction gaming, you do not have dungeons that you can go explore. Sure, you can make those things if you have derelict spacecraft and you do have a map that you can go through it. You can have asteroid bases or anything like that that you can go through and explore. You could have old ruins on a planet and you can explore those. Those are key, in my opinion, to making things easy for a game master to initiate a game of science fiction and still have you explore and do the most popular thing that there is, and that's murder hoboing through room after room after room. Typically, however, when you see these dungeons, they're not going to be populated with, you know, orcs and goblins and all these things that you normally see. Uh, and if for some reason, you can go from one room in a dungeon that'll have an orc, and the next one that'll have an owlbear, and the next one that'll have a minotaur, and in your head, you're going, I, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. But hey, it's fun. We're just going to roll through these guys and get their treasure. That's a little bit harder to do in science fiction. And one of the things you get to in science fiction is there's a lot of travel even more so than a game of fantasy, even though a fantasy, you can take a horse and travel or a boat and travel. You go from, from planet to planet to planet. And, uh, you know, in that standpoint, it, it, uh, a lot of stuff gets caught up in that travel or where you're having to go. And one of the things that I think Star Frontiers did was did a lot of planetary exploration. And if you've ever played D&D, &D, uh, the first edition, and you've ever had something like uh, the uh, Wilderness Survival Guide that you never used but sat on your shelf forever, um, that just shows you that, that exploration of a planet or going through forest after forest or grassland doesn't necessarily work to extend a campaign in any particular way. Sure, there's stuff that you can smatter in, <clears throat> but that's not going to sustain anything. And that, so that's my first thing, dungeons and ease of use. You can incorporate those things if you have a good map or you have good maps. Uh, Misha's maps, which are online. I, I'm a Patreon of his. 
he does fantastic science fiction maps that you can use, even if you're, especially if you're using D20 or a Roll20 or anything like that, um, you can put them online, you can put them up on Zoom, which I do, and then people can make their way through those really cool maps. Um, so you can do Dungeoneering, but you need to make sure that you prep for it and make sure that you want to keep that in there. Now, the second part that makes things so difficult in science fiction gaming is a lack of treasure. This is tough because like the rooms that I just talked about, Orc, Owlbear, uh, Minotaur, you're going to go in and you're going to get their treasure. They have a random treasure or you could have treasure that's in the room. And that's what people are going for. They're murder hoboing it. They want to get the gold. They want to get the silver. And, you know, especially they're really looking for the unique uh, magic items or just magic item in general that get things that make their characters better unique and cool that treasure including the magic motivates people to continue to play this game credits are ambiguous uh, digital things that you can't find a box or a, a coffer or a treasure chest of credits they don't, they don't exist. And if you put gold in or something like that, you've got to go and exchange it or find a place to, to deal with it or, or even see if it has value on a galactic marketplace. And if you find any items, if they're old items, they're going to be worthless because technology will have surpassed them. Or if you find other items uh, in Star Frontier's AK-1500 laser pistol, you know, you can go buy that at the local shop. It's, there's nothing specifically awesome about it. And once you top out with those specific items, because there's so few of them in Star Frontiers or a lot of these games, you, you get the best armor, you get the best screen, you get the best weapon, and you are done. And you're gonna, you can look like the guy right next to you. Uh, and that is anathema to making people want to play this game or keeping their interest in it because they have no place else to go. Once you cap something like that, you're kind of beat. And without magic in your system, you cannot make enough wrinkles unless you're really just pouring yourself into kind of creating new mat and new, new items or futuristic items that can somehow modify characters. And that that is really... Um, really one of the key factors is just treasure and magic in general. It's why when I utilize Star Frontiers as my setting that I like to go in and put um, something in it that is unknown. One of, the, one of my favorite ads, and a lot of people will hate me for this, one of my favorite ads to Star Frontiers uh, was in Zebulon's Guide, they gave the Mentalist. And this is, a lot of people will say this is just... Uh, you know, TSR's love-hate relationship with psionics. They just always wanted to put it in crap, but they never really understood it or knew how to, how to do it. You can argue that. I'm not going to go backwards and forwards on it. But having mentalists in there, especially some of the modifi modifications that have been done by fans in later years, making them, making them manipulator and these different, uh, you know, classes, even with those base abilities, they don't skew anything like you've got a wizard who's throwing fireballs or stuff like that around. But they just give you a little wrinkle. If you put the mentalist in, um, it gives you a new set of parameters that are out of people's, uh, you know, hard science understanding. And I think that's one of the key factors to science fiction gaming. Uh, one of my friends, Mark, he always says, if you run it, if if you were a, a caveman and you ran into a an Abrams tank, you would think it's magic because you don't understand what the hell it is. It's so far above your ability to understand. And when you're playing hard science fiction, it doesn't, mentalism and the ability to transcend time and space, even quantum physics or something like that, could be beyond our understanding, but it might be very base to a different race and it could be seen or perceived as magic even to a high-tech frontier society. That is something I like to incorporate with something that was put into Zebulon's Guide 15,000 years, I think, before the founding of the frontier, before the frontier came into prevalence. There was a race called the Tetrarchs. Uh, take a look at a picture that Simon Adams did of them here.
Now, I love the concept of this race uh, because in my mind, they disappeared according to the timeline and we never see them again, but it doesn't mean that they're gone. So one of the things that I have established with this race, it was their ability to transcend time, space, and body to become something else. And one of the things that I've manifested in with those is the ability to imbue their essence or their spirit into items or things or planets or anything like that, um, which might give you something uh, that just throws the game and people can't explain. Um, let's take an example uh, of a, a poker chip. Um, if somehow a tetrarch had um, imbued their essence or their spirit into it, uh, into this poker chip. Why? We don't know. But yet the poker chip becomes lucky. Anyone who possesses this poker chip wins at gambling, their shots are better, anything like that that happens in their life, this poker chip manifests in some way. And that's because the tetrarch nature that might be inside of it is manipulating out with the mental powers that it has that are so far beyond the scope of anything that in the frontier might understand. Um, if they bound themselves into a weapon, that weapon becomes epic in some fashion, uh, be it a laser or be it a sword or something that could actually be actively used in the frontier. Again, it's not magic, but it's something unexplained. And if you continue to, to pepper these things in, and create some kind of dogma with these tetrarchs and how they're manipulating things within the frontier that nobody really understands, but they create things that people can actively uh, seek. And that's one of the things that I've done with these. I've created a secret society of mega corporations and these things that are always actively looking for tetrarch, tetrarch technology or items that might have manifested the tetrarchs in some way to somehow they want to gain that power. They want to transcend, um, you know, become immortal, become one with the universe. And they're looking to do those things. And you've got another band of society that's trying to keep those things away um, from the, you know, the, the powers that be. And when the characters stumble across those things, it, it allows an entirely new epic um, within the saga that gives you magic and gives you differences that you might find. And also, um, it gives you pieces of technology that are that are actively, um, you know, sought after, which would be tetrarch gems or anything like that that you could actually manifest as treasure uh, in these items, tech or anything like that um, that you can use. And I go more into that in Zebulon's too, but it is something that I think is highly important uh, in science fiction gaming. So. That takes me to the last thing that I think is epically important and a failure of science fiction gaming. And I can't speak to Traveler because it's been too damn long since I played it. Um, but I know it was percentile based. I know you had to roll, a, a, put up a lot of things. I don't, I can't speak if Traveler had levels. I, in, in my head, I'm saying it didn't, but maybe I'm wrong. That's fine. But Star Frontiers has no levels. Uh, a game like Star Trek, the RPG, no levels, percentile based. Star Wars, um, you know, no levels, percent or, uh, you know, dice based. Um, and although I can see the draw of that in the 1980s and people looking at this percentile system and saying how advanced that was versus the clunkiness or the crunchiness of all these dice, um, I can see why they went to that system, but the system doesn't translate well enough in the human brain to understand that people want to progress. And going from 72 to 74 percent in a skill is not possessing, is not progressing in a fashion that makes people want to continue. You want to go in D and D from first to second to third to fourth to fifteenth to twentieth. You want to see how far you can push the envelope of that character. And every time that character goes up levels, they're going to get something special. And you're always out for that carrot. I need something special. I need something special. I need, so I need that next level push, push, push. And it makes you come back again and again to the system. Where in Star Frontiers, you're not doing that. You can, yes, you can take your stats up. Yes, you can take your percentile bases and skills up. 
But that's it. You're not getting anywhere. When, when you take a character and sit down at a table with people that you know, and they say, they can't ask you what level is that character because it's not a level. And, and you can't brag about your ninth level paladin because you don't have nine levels. You don't, you can't have a ninth level enforcer, you know, unless you put the levels in. And I know that in the Star Frontiersman levels were introduced. It's something that I've gone back to in Zebion's Guide Volume 2. I think leveling is, is the absolute importance to understanding the quantitative experience of a gamer Unless you have something to shoot for, unless you're pushing that envelope and trying to get to that next level, you're just lost. And it gets to be blah. And as soon as something gets to be blah and you don't feel like you're, you're trying to achieve something, you move on and you go right back to D&D. And those are problems that you see in percentile-based systems like Star Frontiers and a lot of the other ones that I've mentioned. So, in conclusion... Those are my things that I see wrong with science fiction gaming. Uh, and that's gaming, not science fiction, just science fiction gaming. If you can find a way as a game master to overcome these various things and allow the characters to get the same feel that they're getting from murder hoboing across, you know, through a dungeon, you're gonna be able to bring these, these players back again and again and again because there's always something else that they need to accomplish. Um, and they something else they want. They want this new strange technology. They, they want to be a little better than everyone else. They want to get that extra level. They want, you know, physical treasure that they can take and put somewhere and feel like they've got something on their sheet that means something. Um, so... That's my 17 minutes today of blah blahing about Star Frontiers or just science fiction gaming in general. I'm going to continue on with this series with a lot of other little wrinkles that I have when I see different things. But this is the first one. Uh, I hope you like it. If you have any other suggestions for me about how you sustain a science fiction game, um, please put them below. I'd love to hear them. And, you know, as always, great gaming.